Hello and welcome again to our online Bible study that we call God's Message to the Church. We're looking today at what must happen before the Lord returns. We've looked at this before and so we've looked at different things about uh, the prophecy that it tells us the events that has to take place in the end times and today we're looking at wars and rumors of wars this is what the scripture says in Matthew 24 and let's look at verse 6 Jesus said you shall hear of wars and rumors of war so see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So Jesus said, don't be troubled, but there will be wars. There will be rumors of war. Well, we know that war has been around for a long time. You read in the Bible, there was war all the time in the Old Testament, of course. So it's nothing new, but the thing is that today it's so deadly. There are weapons of mass destruction that can not only destroy a certain area, but could destroy many parts of the world. And that's what we're facing today. Well, let's look at the wars and rumors of wars. We know that after 9-11, that one of the things that happened was what we call the war in Iraq. The the president at that time, President Bush, declared that we would go to war with Iraq and Saddam Hussein. And we spent 15 years, at least 15 years, in Iraq in this war. Now, in the Obama administration, he told and he made the declaration that we would be withdrawing our troops and he gave the date that he would do that and he did and he left equipment military equipment he left money in iraq that isis this terrorist group came in and took over so al-Qaeda inspired militants belonging to the Islamic State of Iraq and greater Syria, which became known as ISIS, began to seize more and more territory in Iraq, particularly in the west of the country. And you see, let me back it up a, a second. You see there Mosul, which is in the province of Nineveh, well, we know that Nineveh is in the scriptures. And uh, like I said, ISIS seized control of Mosul in Nineveh province. And they also took control of other cities throughout Iraq as well. But what does the scripture have to say about Nineveh? I think it's very very interesting. We'll get to that in a second. Here we see that the Iraqis are declaring that Mosul is liberated, that they drove out, finally drove out ISIS, and that they were now free. So after a long 15-year struggle in Iraq, the Iraqi people were now able to liberate this city in Iraq. But what does the scripture have to say about Nineveh, which is 
the province of which Mosul is a part of. Well, we look at the prophet Nahum, and Nahum said, It shall come to pass that all they that look upon you shall flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I find comforters for you? So here it's saying that everybody that looks upon Nineveh, which is where Mosul is, they'll flee from you. Now, why would they flee? Well, today we know that people were fleeing because of ISIS. They were beheading, executing people in the streets. I was just looking at some pictures and I didn't put them on this slide because I just don't want to promote that kind of violence or terror. But this big man that was, you know, dressed in black and had the hood and his face was covered. He had a, a big sword and he had a, a man out in, on the streets on his knees and he was going to behead him in front of the people. And so that's why people were fleeing is because of the terrorism that was taking place. And really, <clears throat> Nahum says, where shall I seek comforters for you? Who's going to help you out? Well, we stayed in there a long time, but then, you know, the withdrawal, and then ISIS really took over. So who was going to help them out? No one, really. There was no one to come to their rescue. So they had to depend on themselves. We also look at the prophet Zephaniah in chapter 2, verse 13. And it says, he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. Well, Iraq was part of Assyria. And will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. So that's exactly what happened there in Iraq. And especially in Nineveh, the prophecy that... Nahum and Zephaniah proclaimed actually came true. And we know that since, you know, the time that they've been able to drive out ISIS, they have found massive graves with hundreds of people's bodies, skeletons in these massive graves. And we know that many of those were Christians that were living there in Iraq. So it was just horrendous, just horrendous that Nineveh that we read about, of course, you know, Jonah, the prophet, had gone during his day to preach against Nineveh because they were the original terrorists of the day that Jonah lived in, and Jonah didn't want to go there. But Again, here was just a very sad, sad situation with the situation there in Iraq. And many of our troops, many of our people were deployed in Iraq. And like I said, this war went on for a decade and a half. And then we see pictures like this. And this was in Syria. So in Syria, more than a quarter of a million Syrians lost their lives in four and a half years. Well, the conflict there began with the full-scale civil war. They were protesting against the govern government, against Assad. And then more than 11 million others were forced from their homes as the forces loyal to the president, Assad, and those opposed to his rule, battled one another. And that's where we had the migrant problem. As people were displaced from their homes, they were driven out, and they began to migrate into Europe. But unfortunately, 
there were terrorists that were uh, infiltrating into the migration and they too were being, I mean, there was no vetting of the migrants as they went into Europe. In some countries, they were not vetting them and not seeing if they were legitimate or not. And so you have a lot of these terrorist groups that were migrating into Europe. And now in many places, there are no go zones. We know that Germany was infiltrated with maybe a half a million or more of the migrants. And many of those were terrorists and they just really created havoc on, especially on New Year's Eve just a couple of years ago where people, women were out on the streets and these men got off the uh, train and they began to grope and sexually molest the women that were on the streets celebrating New Year's Eve. And it was just horrendous. I mean, there is such a problem. And then even in the UK and England, many, many Muslims have migrated into England and there are many no-go zones there and we know that there's been terrorist attack after terrorist attack in many of these European countries. And so this has been a horrendous struggle. We've had um, multiple nations involved in this conflict. We had Russia coming in because Putin and Assad are allies, and so Russia came in to help. Iran came in. Turkey was involved. The United States was involved. And the list kept growing and growing and growing of the number of nations or people groups that were getting involved in the civil unrest and the civil war in Syria. And so it kept escalating, but now finally things have calmed down and Russia has begun with uh, withdrawing their troops. And so, you know, things are settled down now, but at one time it was, you know, I didn't know how many nations were going to get involved in this whole thing. But um, I know that Trump came in there and he says, we're going to get rid of ISIS. We're going to do it. And so once he came in, I mean, things began to turn in the other direction. But what does the scripture have to say about Damascus, Syria? Was this fulfilled? Because in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, it said that Damascus will cease being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. Well, that's what Damascus looks like now that it's been bombed and it's just a pile of rubble. It's been destroyed and it's not. Damascus is just a few miles from the border of Israel. So I know that Israel was very concerned about what was going on in Damascus and didn't know that whether the people, especially Iran or some other groups, if they would not escalate what was going on in Damascus and since Israel was just not too far away that they would just bring it on down into Israel. So Israel was on high alert during this time. But the thing is, here is Damascus, one of the ancient, ancient continuously populated city of the world. Damascus has lasted for thousands of years. Like I said, we read about it during the time of Jonah, of course, where he went. Um, I'm sorry, I was thinking about Nineveh. Skip that part. But we know that Damascus has been around for a long, long time, thousands and thousands of years. So Isaiah 17, 1 has been fulfilled. And I was thinking about years ago, I was listening to Bible prophets, Bible teachers, and they were 
talking about wondering how this prophecy would be fulfilled. And they were speculating. They were thinking, well, maybe Israel will have to bomb them for some reason. Maybe because Iran would come in there. Or, you know, again, they it was just speculation on many people many people's part as to what would happen to cause Damascus that has been around for thousands of years as a, a populated city I mean what would cause it to be destroyed well here is the answer to it and it didn't turn out the way that many people thought it would but uh, you know it's just a ruin and again it is a fulfillment of the scriptures during our lifetime. Can you imagine that? Just think about that, that all of this took place during our lifetime. The prophecies, Isaiah writing thousands, you know, a long time ago, a long time before Jesus came on the scene, that he gave this prophecy about this, and now it's finally fi finding its fulfillment in present day well we talked about wars and rumors of wars what about uh, kingdom against kingdom what is happening now is that there is a lot of conflict that's going on between saudi arabia and yemen yemen is on saudi arabia's southern border there at the gulf at arden and the Houthi rebels that are being backed by Iran are, well, they just recently fired a rocket at the Saudi Arabian royal palace. And the Saudi Arabians had to, they had a, a defense system that was able to take that missile down or it would have hit the royal palace in Saudi Arabia. So there is a lot of tension and a lot of conflict. And the Houthi rebels, backed by Iran, of course, is um, Shiite Muslims because Iran is Shiite and Saudi Arabia is Sunni. And it's in Saudi Arabia that it's believed that Muhammad lived that was back in uh, the 600s um, AD, that when he lived, 600 AD is when Muhammad lived, and he lived in Saudi Arabia, and that's where you have Mecca and, you know, other some other cities where he lived and that they became holy sites. And so they have the black stone there in Saudi Arabia. But Iran is Shiite, a Shiite Muslim. And so the Muslims are split between those who back Iran and those that back Saudi Arabia and their coalition. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But there is a lot of conflict now that you have this terrorist group in Yemen and that the you know backed by Iraq I mean I'm sorry Iran backed by Iran and so there is you know a lot of tension between these countries here so who's for or who's who's against what's going on there between Saudi Arabia and Yemen well those that are offering non-military support is, of course, us and the UK, France, Turkey, and Belgium. Those offer, offering military support is a coalition that is led by Saudi Arabia. And so you have her neighbors, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, Senegal, Sudan and Malaysia. So those 10 are in coalition with Saudi Arabia, but those opposing military action is Iran, Russia, and China. Those three are allies together. But you know, you have the two superpowers of China 
and Russia that is backing Iran. And they do not want the military action against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. So now you've, you know, you've got all the players on the table. And again, the source, this was, this chart was done in 2015. But of course, like I said, it has escalated further since that time. So you can see at the top in this map, you see that at the top it's Saudi Arabia and Yemen is on Saudi Arabia's southern border. And Yemen's capital, number one, is now under control of the Houthi rebels. And again, I don't know when this chart was made. There was no time stamp on it. I just got it off the internet. Uh, the third largest city, number two, had deadly protests against the current Houthi occupation. And then the air base, number three, that hosted U.S. forces was recently evacuated and it's now held by the Houthi rebels. And then of course you have the port city number four, Aden, that um, is a refuge for the president until currently, uh, now it's under Houthi assault. So this chart shows in the different color coded, the green is the Yemen government that's backed by Saudi Arabia, their coalition. So the green is backed by Saudi Arabia. And this is as of 2016, a year ago. The peach color, that is the former government, but now the Houthi military have control of it. And then the yellow, yellowish color, is Al-Qaeda and the tribal allies. So the nation of Yemen is being torn apart by these terrorist, this terrorist group, the Houthi rebels, backed by Iran. And again, Iran is wanting a foothold there because they want to destroy Saudi Arabia. That's the goal there because what we're gonna see is kingdom against kingdom. The Shiite, excuse me, the Shiites versus the Sunni rebel, uh, Sunni Muslims are in conflict with one another. And so you have this going on in this part of the world. Well, you look at the Middle East, and again, I don't know the timestamp of this chart. It says five years ago, but I think it's probably more, uh, later than that but anyway this chart shows as you see it's color coded the green indicates stability the yellow is unstable the orange would be chaotic and the red is civil war so at this time that this chart was made iraq now iraq has liberated its country uh, gotten rid of the, for the most part, they've gotten rid of ISIS. Uh, Afghanistan, of course, you know, that's been constantly uh, a war. We have troops deployed in that area. We had troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we still have troops in Afghanistan. So this is the way it was just a few years ago, but and you see, even Yemen and Saudi Arabia were in the stable position. But look at it today. You see that Yemen is chaotic because of the Houthi rebels that are there. And it's just creating a civil war in Yemen. You see Saudi Arabia is now unstable. You see Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Pakistan, and Lebanon, they're all chaotic. And we know that in Lebanon, this is where Hezbollah is. They're backed by Iran. And so you have Yemen that is uh, the Houthi rebels there that is backed by Iran. 
And you see that Pakistan also is chaotic. And you see civil war in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Well, I say that this chart is dated because uh, Syria is now calmed down. Russia you know, has withdrawn troops. Um, things have settled down now. Same is true with Iraq. It's not true with Afghanistan, but uh, you can just see the instability and chaos and the conflicts that are taking place in the Middle East as we speak. Well, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it talks about Gog and Magog and the different locations there. So you see the names of Meshach and Magog and uh, Tabal and uh, different ones. Persia is listed, but we know that Persia is Iran. Put, you see there in northern Africa. Kush is also in Sudan and Ethiopia. So these are the nations that we're looking at. And, you know, many people believe that uh, Russia will be involved as well when it talks about Rosh. And they, you know, I guess there is some question whether it is Russia or not with some people. Um, but we do know that it's Gog and Magog. Um, if you look at this more ancient map, you can see uh, that it has a little up there at the top. It says Magog, and it's pointing to an area there that is at the Caspian Sea, between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. Uh, Tagarma is below the back, um, Black Sea. It would be in Turkey. Meshach and Tubal would also be in the Turkish area. And Gomer, you see, is there on the border of the Black Sea. Uh, so whether it is Russia or not, uh, that is debatable. But again, we'll see how that plays out. But we haven't really seen the fulfillment of Gog and Magog yet, but that's what we're keeping our eye on. But we do know that it includes territory that, like we saw in the other chart, that is, let's go back, you see the chaotic, chaotic condition or the instability in these locations. And so we're keeping an eye on that to see how that's going to play out. But we also have rumors of war. And one of the biggest issues today is with Kim Jong-un, who is threatening a nuclear attack on America. And every time that we push back on Kim Jong-un, he responds with, he says, you're not going to take me down, and I'm going to shoot you out of the water. Kind of, you know, he, he has a lot of rhetoric, and so there's a lot of rhetoric that's going back and forth. The thing is that he is doing these military testing, these uh, missile tests, even though it is uh, causing nuclear fallout, even in his own country, even when he does it underground, it is creating uh, an earthquake type of event, and it's causing nuclear fallout to get into the atmosphere. And so we have in our country, Mattis, Mattis who warns of, a massive, overwhelming military response to North Korea. I have to say that word on the street is that after the Winter Olympics in 2018, in February, in South Korea, that is believed that's when war will ignite with North Korea, that that's the timeline that it will begin sometime after the Winter Olympics in Seoul, South Korea. So, I mean, things are really heating up. We know that Trump went to China and 
spoke with Putin in his trip to Asia, went to the Philippines and Vietnam and some other locations, South Korea and Japan, and talked to the people there. And he doesn't want to get involved militarily. I mean, who wants to create a nuclear conflict? Uh, so he's been trying to get China and Russia to take care of their little brother because Korea is on their border. And of course, Russia and China do not want a nuclear confrontation to take place in North Korea because it would have an effect upon their countries. I mean, the fallout would spread not only in North Korea, but in the surrounding areas as well. So they certainly do not want a conflict on their border. And so you have Putin saying, well, who's they, who are they going to support, really? Are they going to help the United States, or are they going to help North Korea? You know, that's the question. Because you look at uh, this chart, and you see that uh, North Korea says the more sanctions imposed, the faster it will move towards completing nukes. And this was in September of this year that he made that statement. But over on the right, you have Putin saying that weapons of mass destruction will not be used on the Korean peninsula. So what does that mean? How are you going to put an end to Kim Jong-un without some type of uh, confrontation? And of course, who wants a nuclear com confrontation? Uh, nobody except, I guess, Korea, North Korea, and Kim Jong-un. It doesn't seem to bother him at all. But then you have this that says China is preparing to join forces with North Korea in World War III, warns military experts. So who will China and Russia really back, or who will they support, or who will they try to help out? Well, like I said, that um, China and Russia are allies of North Korea, and so it just seems that that's who they're going to back, and that's who they're going to help. So would they come against the United States if we went in there and were to try to take Kim Jong-un out? I think the president has made it clear that we don't want to, this confrontation. We want you to handle it. And so there's been sanctions by the UN that is really, I mean, the people of North Korea are starving to death but it doesn't seem to bother Kim Jong-un. Doesn't matter to him if his people are starving. Doesn't seem to have affected him in any way. So this is a very volatile and a very, very serious situation. So these wars and rumors, of, the rumors of war, I mean, they're getting heated up because this is going to come to a head so we need to be in prayer, pray, pray, pray that we do not enter into a nuclear conflict with North Korea or if Russia and China get involved and join forces with North Korea. We don't want to get into a conflict with, with uh, Russia and China or North Korea. So it's a very, very dangerous. And you know, the Bible says that in the last days, perilous times will come. So we are definitely living in that time frame. We look also in Revelation chapter 16, and it says, it talks about the sixth angel. This is part of the bold judgments. There are three series of plagues that come. The first is the seal judgments, as that we call it. 
The second is the trumpet judgments. And then the final one is the bowl or vile judgment that will come upon the earth. And so the sixth of the seven angels of the last series of judgment pours out his vial upon the great river Euphrates that is right there at the, the border of Iraq in that area. And this is where the river Euphrates is. It says the water will be dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And it describes the kings of the east having a 200 million man army that marches towards Armageddon. So we know that that is going to happen. So what countries would that represent? What countries would it represent? Because, you know, you have China, you have Russia, you have North Korea, you have Cambodia and Thailand and Vietnam and India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all those countries. Definitely, these groups of nations could certainly, with no sweat at all, provide a 200 million man army that would march and come from the east and go down into Israel. So who will be involved in that? And that's something that, you know, we're keeping a close eye on to see all the players on the table and see what might happen in that, that confrontation, that battle. I mean, I can't imagine 200 million man army coming through your territory. I mean, it's just horrendous. But then don't forget, don't forget the Israel watch because Israel is the timepiece. It's God's timepiece. We have to look at the events that take place in Israel. And of course, we know that just recently when Trump made the announcement that he was recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, this has just set the world on fire. Uh, just recently, just a few days ago, Samantha B, who is a comedian who has a program on TBS, she uh, was mocking and scoffing President Trump. She was mocking and scoffing at Christian leaders like John Hagee, who is very supportive of Israel. He is the head of Kufi, which is Christians United for Israel, who has pushed and who has lobbied the government time after time after time to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He's one of the biggest proponents here in the United States that has stood for Israel. They also, uh, she also mocked and scoffed Pastor Paul Begley, who has a YouTube channel. He is he lives in Indiana, but he has studied prophecy and has been a preacher for many many years. Uh, he's not only on YouTube, he's on Twitter, he's on Blog Talk. Well, he was on Blog Talk radio he is on roku live stream all the different outlets social outlets he has a live program every day sometimes twice a day uh, that he talks about current events in light of biblical prophecy and he's tried to open the eyes of people to let them know that what is happening you can read it in the pages of the Bible. And he says, you know, there's a lot of churches out there that will not even touch prophecy with a 10-foot pole. And so people in churches are clueless as to what is really happening in the world. 
and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Well, he says, I don't know why she was picking on me because he says, I'm just a country preacher. Now, he's been a plant manager and a salesperson, and he's done a lot of things in his career, but he's, uh, he preaches, he's an evangelist, he, he leads people to the Lord, he baptizes people and makes sure that he tells people you need to be baptized, and he's baptized hundreds of people just this last year as he's gone around to conferences. Um, people want to know what is happening from a biblical standpoint, and so they turn into him. So he's had you know over a million views, even though he's been on the air, so to speak. He also has television program as well but in, in many locations around the, the United States. So uh, he says, I don't know why she was picking on me because, you know, he doesn't have a mega church like a lot of people. His church is online, but it's a powerful church evidently uh, because there is a grassroot people, biblically-based people who want to know what is really happening in the world around us. And how close are we to the coming of the Lord? And he says over and over, I'm not telling you the date because no one knows the day or the hour. But he says, I'm telling you, here's what the scripture says and here's what's happening. You do the math. So Israel is a, you know, the timepiece. And it does say in the scripture that in the last days, scoffers will come. Now, this Samantha B, she was so upset. She was using the F word. She was blaspheming Christian leaders like John Hagee and Pastor Paul Begley and, and another one and, um, and Christians in general. Uh, she was also blaspheming the name of God. So... People are upset who do not know the Lord. They are very, very upset, and they don't like it that Israel is being recognized, that their capital of Jerusalem, which the Bible says is the capital of the great king. Jesus, when he comes, he's going to set up his kingdom there in Jerusalem. Well, the Antichrist is going to attempt to do the same thing before that happens. But as we look before in Zechariah chapter 12, here's what the prophet saw. He said, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness. Now, other versions says a cup of trembling to all the surrounding peoples. So all the nations, Jordan, even the king of Jordan went to the Vatican recently uh, because of this very issue about making Jerusalem the capital of Israel. And the Pope just came out uh, a day or so ago. It was his Christmas Eve message. And he was calling for a two-state solution, even though the Bible says that judgment will come to those that divide up the land of Israel. So those that tried to part the land or divide up the land of Israel will be judged by God. But anyway, Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling or drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, or against the West Bank and Jerusalem. It shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. God, if you touch Israel, if you touch Jerusalem, you're touching the apple of God's eye. And God will supernaturally intervene on the behalf of his people. You can see it all throughout the scriptures that God intervened in, on behalf of the Jewish people against all odds. Jehoshaphat, read of his story in Chronicles 
chapter 20, you, you read that story. Jehoshaphat was, he had a massive army coming against him. And he was scared to death, but the prophet told him, don't be afraid, for the Lord your God will take care of you. And trust me, God's going to take care of Jerusalem. He's going to take care of Israel. Yes, Israel will be going through some difficult days, but just know this, that in the end, those that come against Jerusalem, those that come against Israel will be destroyed. So wars and rumors of wars, we're seeing it happen every day. So we know that the coming of the Lord is very, very near. Are we ready? Are we prepared? Are we ready for the coming of the Lord? Will we be ready when he comes? Will we be caught up together with him in the clouds to be with him forever or will we be left behind and have to face the wrath of God that will be poured out upon the world I pray that we are ready that our hearts are prepared just as we prepared our hearts for the advent for the come first coming of the Lord I pray that the same will be true concerning the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It will be a glorious day. I mean, it will be the best of times and it will be the worst of times. It will be the best of times for those who are ready and who will meet the Lord, but it will be the worst of times for those whose hearts are hardened and will not receive what he freely offers us, salvation, hope, joy, peace. So my prayer, my prayer is that you be ready, that I be ready, that we would try to help other people be ready for that time. That we would not be caught off guard, but that we would be on board when the time comes. We don't know when that might happen, within a few years, a few months, whenever it is. I pray that we will all be ready for that event. So, Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings upon each and every one that you would touch their hearts, their lives, that you would give them the assurance of their salvation, that you would fill them with hope that, as it says in Titus, we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that's what we're looking for. So get ready, get ready, get ready. He is coming. He is coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.